everybody, my name is Andrzej and since about a week I'm one of the backend engineers at Lightband. And the plan for today is to talk about event sourcing. Uh, this presentation is constantly evolving. Currently it's based on five different commercial products, completely different domains, completely different stories, challenges. And my plan was to distill the most available lessons learned and present them for you. Um, I suppose that explaining basics of event sourcing is quite pointless and I don't want to spend too much time on that because I have a feeling that most of you are already quite familiar with this kind of concept, but don't worry. There is no presentation about event sourcing without this boring slide. So let's get it over with very quickly. In classic systems, we are saving our state aggregates to the database as the most current state. And in case of some change, we will simply overwrite this state. Where in event sourcing, state in database not exist anymore. I mean, you can save a snapshot of the state as a performance optimization, but this is totally optional. What you are saving and what is your source of truth are events. And when you reply events uh, from your event store, you will get exactly the same state as on the left side of the slide. So a shopping cart with item A and B. But with events, you will also get more information. So item C was added and then removed from the order. It looks like a pretty interesting business information. Maybe based on that fact, uh, we can send a voucher for this item to the user. Maybe we could send a push notification with some replacement for this item. Maybe this information is completely irrelevant at this point for your business. But what is crucial here is that you as a developer should not decide what business facts are important and what's not. Uh, you should store all of them and provide necessary data when needed. And fun fact about event sourcing from one of Greg Young's presentations. Uh, by the way, Greg Young is one of the event sourcing evangelists. If you don't know this gentleman, well, you should definitely Google him. Really nice materials, presentations. So the fun fact is that humans have been using event sourcing for thousands of years. The, uh, let's say the first implementation of event sourcing was found on clay tablets in Mesopotamia 9,000 years BC. And it was used for persisting marketplace transactions. So how many ships, uh, bread loaves, grain were bought or sold. And this way the Mesopotamian trader could very easily recalculate the state of possession, not by doing this manually, like counting ships, but just replying facts from these clay tablets. Uh, 2005, another famous gentleman, Martin Fowler, wrote an article about event sourcing where you can read such a sentence. Enterprise applications that use event sourcing are rare, but I have seen a few applications or parts of application that use it. And this is kind of sad. <laughs> 11,000 years in total seems like enough time to validate some concept on production, don't you think? Uh, fortunately, we have 2022, or unfortunately, it depends how far east you live these days, but let's say 2022, and from my observations, which are obviously biased, but from my observations, this concept is finally getting popular and popular each day. And why? Well, we are building completely different systems than 15, 20 years ago, and at some point, you simply don't have a choice. To move forward, to expand your business, to scale, you will either end up with something very close to event sourcing or with full event sourcing adaptation. And I, I'm observing the same patterns in basically any event-driven system. Uh, so why event sourcing? As I mentioned, with event sourcing, you'll get complete log of all state changes in the system. This is especially useful for your business. No data is lost. But for you as a developer, it's pretty handy as well. Why? Debugging. So many times when I was trying to find a bug in my system, it was necessary to replay event by event. And trust me, debugging this way is a completely different story. It's like time machine, but more real. You can move backward, forward. This is super handy. And someone could argue, OK, I can do the same with logs. Really? <laughs> From my perspective, uh, perspective, logs are usually useless because they don't have enough data to uh, analyze the problem. And in case of some major failures, they are simply gone. 
Uh, also, people invest in event sourcing because of these two reasons, performance and scalability. And of course, this depends on the actual implementation, but at least with event sourcing, you are ready for it. And the last point, uh, event sourcing, finally, with event sourcing, an asynchronous, decoupled, even driven communication between microservices works like a charm. Okay, before we jump into details, we need to talk about one, one more acronym, which is CQRS, so Command Query Responsibility Segregation. In CQRS systems, the responsibility for handling commands and writes is separated from handling queries and reads. And this separation is not only on the software level, but also on the hardware level. So different deployments, different holes, different databases. And you can implement CQRS without event sourcing, but implementing event sourcing without CQRS, it's quite pointless. I mean, you can, it's possible, but it will be really, really hard to squeeze maximum potential from event sourcing architecture without CQRS. Uh, that's why these two are implemented more or less together. And during my journey with event sourcing systems, I've ex extracted a few different levers of event sourcing adaptations. And the first level is so-called transactional event sourcing, where in one big transaction, we are saving our events and updating all read models in, in the same transaction, basically. And uh, it's very easy to start, very easy to implement, no magic, zero eventual consistency, but performance of such solution is quite limited. Sooner or later, this, this, pro this transaction will, will be quite slow. Uh, updating all various read models will take some time, and this will slow down your writes. Uh, still, I'm not saying that you should never ever implement event sourcing this way. It's actually quite nice starting point to play with it, especially if you are working on, pro of, on proof of concept and, uh, and you have no idea how many people will, will use your application. Maybe no one, like in one of my cases. Uh, yeah, a few more links about it. Uh, very nice articles, how to start, uh, how to implement event sourcing based on the relation database. Uh, so, uh, just follow the links from the slide. Uh, quick summary, easy to implement, easy to reason about, zero eventual consistency, but performance and scalability, not so great. Second level. This time, the scope of this problematic transaction is, is much smaller. We are saving only events in transaction, so it's like append-only operation, and basically any database will love to handle it. It's, it's super fast operation if you don't need to update anything and just, uh, uh, just write new events. So we definitely improved the command service side. Uh, there is a new piece on the diagram, which is a projector, so something needs to read uh, new events and update various read models. And you can scale this part as well, because you can launch like hundreds of projectors. So it's good, right? Sort of. <laughs> Since this level and further, we are entering a uh, eventual consistency world which could materialize in two specific problems. So the first problem is that if we launch hundreds of projectors here, we can by accident put more pressure on our event store. Well, it depends. Normally it's not, in, it's not a problem because you will have like a 10, 20 projectors, but still it's possible. But there's a second problem, which is a lag. How often should I query my database to check for new events? Each three second, each one second, I can imagine many systems when an additional second of eventual consistency is, is simply not acceptable. Uh, so how can we uh, fix it? Before that, quick summary. Uh, performance and scalability improved, but eventual consistency increased event store load with question mark and lags. Third level. Another new piece on the diagram, event bus. And many people will disagree with me that introducing event bus here is like an overkill, over-engineering. And that's true. <laughs> if you have five projectors and you don't care about latency, then, then don't do this. But this extra buffer between your event store and your projectors will give you some nice benefits. So right now, I can launch hundreds of projectors. It's not a problem anymore because event buses were designed to, load, uh, to handle such load. And I need to query my database only once for new events. Uh, so we definitely decrease the database load. Uh, unfortunately, the problem of lag still remains. So how often should I query my database? Maybe each millisecond. I suppose that launching 1,000 requests per second is not a good idea. So the naive approach would be to 
save the events to the event store, and then send them to the event bus in the transaction. And of course, transaction on two heterogeneous systems is, is a really, really bad idea. Uh, so quick patch for that. We are saving only events in transaction, and then after successful saving, we can send them from the application perspective to the event bus. Sounds easy, but we need to put some guarantees here. So at least once delivery is a must, no events can be lost. And also we need to produce events in exactly the same order as in event store. Uh, how to do this? So, well, we can use something called sequence number tracking. So each event uh, should have a strictly monotically increased uh, sequence number. It could be per aggregate, it could be global, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if the sequence number is plus one, then yeah, I can send it to the event bus. If it's plus zero or minus one, this is a duplicate, I can skip it. If it's plus two or more, it means that I have a gap in my event stream, let's say, and I need to fill this gap directly from database. And in 99% of cases, you won't see any gaps, uh, but you need to be ready for some restarts, crashes, etc. And in some cases, in some, let's say, frameworks, it will be easier to implement this than in the other ones. Um, so let's validate our architecture. Uh, query services are stateless services, so to scale this part, you just need to launch another instance, put some load balancer on top of it, and you're done. Uh, read models. So you can have a separate database per read model. Uh, you can have separate database per query, not a problem. You can launch hundreds of projectors because you will, good, you will use good scalable event bus. And event store, can we scale it? To answer this question, we need to first answer a question about uh, command service side, because command service side must be consistent. And to achieve consistency, we have at least two options. The first option is the most popular one, so the optimistic locking. But then if we go with optimistic locking here, we are forced to use a uh, uh, database that supports such locking mechanism. In most cases, a single host relation database. So scaling capabilities here are limited by scaling capabilities here. Now, if you need to handle huge load, then I would recommend a different strategy. And uh, the strategy is to handle concurrency on your application level and implement something called single writer principle. And this way, you can use any event store you want. It could be a distributed database, whatever. But to scale this part, you would need a sharded cluster solution with all its advantages and disadvantages. And I hope we'll find some time to cover this as well. So here is our final version of Uber Turbo Scaling Event Sourcing Architecture. Please do not start with something like this. <laughs> uh, my idea was to show you the ultimate gold, holy grail, uh, and now your job is to find the level which suits your needs and uh, yeah, and to know the whole journey. Uh, so summary of the third level, performance and scalability really great, eventual consistency, complex implementation, and if you want to read more about this optimistic locking versus single writer, I could recommend, uh, it's one of my favor favorite uh, blog posts with, uh, connected, let's say, to event sourcing uh, stuff. Uh, so just follow the link from the slide. Uh, to cover this topic f fully, I should mention about two alternatives. So first one is uh, to copy events from your event store to event bus, you could use change capture data, CDC. It's a really nice, uh, let's say, functionality or feature of some databases. Uh, but uh, my piece of advice is that uh, it is okay to use it for a single host databases. For a distributed databases, uh, CDC is, is quite challenging to manage. And because we desire so much streaming capabilities from our event store, maybe we could use event bus as an event store. And here is a link to my friend's article about how to implement event sourcing based on Kafka. The article is really great, but uh, be careful with that because uh, this kind of implementation will work very efficient for very, very, very specific use cases, but it's not a general purpose solution. So make sure that you understand all Kafka concepts correctly before you actually use it. Uh, not covered today, but worth to check uh, command sourcing and events collaboration, let's say it's, it's your homework. So 
we know what we want to implement, now the question is how. And we have options like custom implementation, library, or framework. And if you look at event sourcing from a domain perspective, this is quite a trivial pattern. You have only three main building blocks, so commands, events, state, and you just need to implement two methods, process, command, and return list of events, or a single event, and then apply uh, event and return new version of the state. And if you go with fold left with this method, then you will get the current version of the state. And that's why many people uh, suggest to implement event sourcing by yourself. That's partially true. Uh, I would recommend to implement uh, the domain part by yourself, that, that, that's, that's fine. But your application will be production ready when you also de deliver a few more set but require features like snapshotting, failover recover, persistence, debugging, sharding, serialization, schema evolution, huge topic, uh, concurrency access, etc., etc. And implementing this by yourself is a recipe for failure. Don't get me wrong, I would love to write my own event sourcing framework, but at the same time, I know that I will do all possible mistakes. So uh, just use something that, that was implemented and tested by many programmers, many developers. Uh, unfortunately, using any framework has its hidden cost. Here's a, an example of JPA implementation. Uh, you have a business entity with some business code and some JPA annotation. It looks okay, right? No, we just mixed two really important uh, responsibilities here. So obviously our business code and some infrastructure, infrastructure instructions how to persist this entity. And someone could argue, so what? If I remove all this annotation, the code will be exactly the same. That's true. But at the same time, this is a very, very simple example. And trust me, all tutorials are based on simple examples. Let's say that I would like to have a map of maps in my domain model. I suppose that translating such a field to a JPA will be problematic. I'm not sure if it's even possible. Maybe it is. Uh, most likely I will change my implementation to be something more JPA compatible. And personally, I hate such compromises where my persistence layer is dictating me how should I implement my business code. As Uncle Bob said many times, persistence should be only a plugin to our domain. Unfortunately, the same story applies to event sourcing framework. So here is an example from Axon framework, uh, user aggregate mixed with some Axon framework's annotation. The same story uh, from Lagon framework. Uh, it's Scala code, so don't read it, but uh, focus on the imports. Uh, you have JSON formats here. Uh, come on, on my domain level, I don't care about JSON. I don't care about serialization. I just want to write my business code. And how to do this? Uh, well, back to the beginnings, I would say, and proper packaging. We can start with something really simple. In your domain package, let's put some, let's pull all the domain related event sourcing pieces. So commands, events, state. And application package is the place for the framework or, or library. If you want to see the full source of source code example, follow the link. Um, the repository is pretty old, but the overall idea is still valid. So this way, your event sourcing aggregate uh, will look like the snippet on the slide. So just uh, plain Scala and two methods. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you should implement your whole business uh, code in just two methods. These are only like um, entry points to your aggregate, nothing more. Uh, well, and this code will be trivial. Or not. It will be exactly as complex as your domain. What is trivial here is how you will test this code. You don't have to launch Spring Context to test this code. You don't have to launch Actor System to test this code. You just need to write simple unit test. That's it. And for me, it's, it's really important. And once again, application package for all the set stuff and domain package for domain logic, domain validation, and in perfect world, zero event sourcing frameworks. And if at some point, I would decide that, okay, this event sourcing solution is not good for me. I will simply remove this package and my domain will be untouched. Uh, library versus framework, because I'm using these notions quite often. Wh what's the difference? Uh, so usually removing a library from your code base is much easier than removing a framework. And a good example here is uh, Akka persistent versus Lagom. 
Lagom is, or actually was, <laughs> because it's no longer supported, but Lagom is a full-blown event sourcing framework. You just need to put commands here, events there, and Lagom will do the magic for you. And which is nice, unless you have a very specific business use case, and then you need to adjust to the framework. Aka persistence is one level of abstraction lower. It will give you all the necessary technical features for building uh, production-ready event sourcing solution, but at the same time, you will need to handle more stuff by yourself. Which choice is better? It depends. Uh, I'm not saying that you should never ever use framework, that's, that's not my point, uh, but be careful with that. Take your time, validate existing solutions, and yeah, uh, create some proof of concepts. Mm. And from my perspective, I could honestly recommend Akka person typed, still not a framework, but this time everything is well organized, um, it's much harder to do something stupid, and I, I've used it many times successfully. And it's not like I'm Lightband's employee, so I, I'm obligated to sell something to you. It's like an honest suggestion. And actually, maybe there's something different on the menu, and uh, say hello to Calix. So this is the newest <laughs> Lightband product. Uh, what is Calix? From this presentation perspective, this is basically event sourcing as a service, or serverless event sourcing. But that's not entirely true. It, it's, it's way more. Uh, I mean, it's a complete ecosystem for building highly reactive, scalable, distributed systems in a serverless mode. So normally, if uh, years ago, if to deploy something on production, you, you would need to focus on infrastructure layer, so servers, storage, networking, all the sad stuff. And then application layer, uh, business logic frameworks, databases, uh, etc. Now we live in the cloud, so we don't care about infrastructure, <laughs> partially true, uh, so that we can focus only on application level. Uh, but uh, the same problems still remain. So architecture complexity, skill availability, time to market, and cost issues. So with Calix, you can focus only on business logic, and we will do the rest for you. So you don't have to think about databases, about uh, at least once delivery, uh, communication patterns, etc., etc. And I don't want to spend more time on that. Uh, if you have more questions about it, just. Uh, just uh, do the. Uh, I will try to answer them after the talk, uh, or you can do your own research at calix.io. Okay, next big question is uh, because we know what we want to implement, how now where to store events, and we can store them in a file, <laughs> in narration database, event store, MongoDB, Kafka, Cassandra, etc., etc. And if you go with now, the storage selection depends on the previous choice. So if you go with custom implementation, then yeah, you can use any database you want. If you go with, let's say, Akka, because I know it quite well, then your choice is limited to, let's say, relation database, single host database, and a distributed database, like Cassandra. That's not true. Many other databases are supported. But for sake of this presentation, single host database versus distributed database. And relation database is sounds like a safe choice. Everyone knows how to set up it, maintain it, uh, even on production, so it's a safe choice, right? Well, sort of. Uh, it depends uh, how much load you need to handle, uh, because vertically scaling a single host database will be, might be a problem uh, sooner than you think. Uh, that's why I would recommend to use, or at least to analyze, uh, distributed databases like Cassandra, because with Cassandra, you will get partitioning by design. Your data will be spread across all nodes in the cluster. Uh, replication by design. So in case of some node failure, you can always uh, read your events from a different node. Uh, leaderless architecture. So uh, in comparison to Mongo, where you have um, leader follower architecture. So in case of leader failure, uh, strange things could happen. And here, any node can handle any query. So no single point of failure. Uh, Cassandra is optimized for writes, which is pretty important for, e for event sourcing. So just two nodes uh, can handle like 1,000 transactions, 100,000 transactions per second. If that's not enough for you, then you can scale it horizontally, almost linearly, let's say. Uh, be aware that there, there is a growing alternative to Cassandra, which is SilaDB. <laughs> Basically, it's Cassandra without JVM. 
<laughs> so the same protocols, the same ideas, uh, but this time C++ and sisterlib, and even more throughput. Uh, some time ago, it was not fully supported by Aka Persistence. I'm not sure what is the status right now, but if you want to uh, check it, just follow the link. Uh, yeah, so we know where to store events now, how to store them, how to serialize them. And uh, we, we could go with plain text serialization like JSON, XML, YAM, uh, or binary serialization. And I know that most of you will choose JSON anyway, but <laughs> let me show you some alternatives. Uh, first, let's compare plain text serialization and binary serialization. So, plain text serialization by definition is human readable. It's, it's very convenient to just select some uh, events from your event store and analyze them directly from the query results. That's, that's really handy. In case of binary serialization, you need an additional step to transform bytes to something human readable. And is it a problem? Not really. Uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, super fast to create a tool that will do this automatically in the flight for you. Of course, such tools should be created up front. But there is nothing like a good motivation, and burning production is the best motivator you can imagine. Uh, so with JSON, you can face some strange problems with precisions. Uh, let's not waste time on that. Uh, links, links on the slide. Uh, binary serialization is more compressed. The actual saving depends on your events model. So in my case, it was from 60 to 70 percent of saving on the disk space, and you might say that, okay, but storage is cheap, etc., etc. Well, that's true, but uh, the amount of data we are gathering is growing really fast. And actually, good SSD, uh, I mean, large SSD drives for DB purposes are not so cheap, in my opinion. And all uh, benchmarks are pretty consistent. Binary serialization is much faster than plain text serialization, which shouldn't be a surprise because in case of plain text serialization, a lot of additional steps uh, are necessary to serialize and then deserialize something. And the last point, really important, with uh, binary serialization, schema evolution support is on a completely different level than in case of uh, plain text serialization. So, I hope that you get my point. Uh, binary serialization is quite interesting, so now which one should we choose? Java serialization. It is slow, it's dangerous, don't use it. Maybe only for prototyping. Uh, Cryo, very nice, very fast, but it will work only with JVM applications. So let's not limit uh, our uh, architecture only to JVM applications. Maybe some, I don't know, Node.js developer would like to read our events as well. Thrift from Facebook. Uh, when it comes to functionalities, it's basically the same as protocol buffers from Google, and I know the second better, so we have protocol buffers from Google and Avro from Hadoop. Now I could spend another 15 minutes or so just explaining the difference between two of them, but we will do this very quickly and basically jump to conclusions. So both, both are really great when it comes to language, multi-language support, uh, many languages are supported, but the actual support might be different. So let's say uh, in case of protocol buffers, support in Scala is way better than in Java. Uh, in Avro support in Python, it's not so great. You are forced to use only the Avro generic schema approach. Uh, both are really fast uh, when it comes to serialization. Both will produce really small payload size. Uh, both will give you full compatibility. Now, full compatibility, well, backward compatibility is obvious. You need to be able to read old events from your database, but you also need forward compatibility for rolling updates and also uh, to update your, let's say, command service site without updating all projectors. So I, I want to be able to uh, create new version of the event and, don't ha and uh, not be forced to update all projectors at the same time. So with forward compatibility, it, it's possible. So in both cases, you can add a field, remove a field, even rename a field. From my perspective, it's easier to do this in protocol buffers, but we have a tie again. So what is the difference? <laughs> okay, so with Avro, I mean, from my perspective, the biggest advantage of Avro is that, let's say in Scala, you can write your code first and based on your code, you can generate Avro schema, which is super nice because you will write less boilerplate code. 
at the same time, you can pollute your domain with some Avro specific annotations. So it's, it's, it's a little bit dangerous. Uh, also, read and writer schema distribution is quite painful, but that's, that's, uh, let's skip it. In case of protocol buffers, uh, first you will write your schema and then generate the code from that schema. And the generated code is so ugly that you will have your, let's say, domain version of the event and serializable version of the event. And then you will need to write a lot of boilerplate code to translate from one word to the other. From my perspective, I can pay the price because I want to have a clean domain without, without any uh, serialization uh, involved inside the domain. Uh, which choice is better? <laughs> As usual, it depends. Uh, if you want to read more about it, uh, here is a link to my article about uh, the serialization strategy for event sourcing, and you will get all the information I just skipped uh, uh, in this article. <laughs> okay. The last big question, uh, how to compose an event? And most people will start with delta change. So let's say that I would like to emit user funds with withdrawn event, and in that event I will put only the amount of the withdrawal, so the delta. It's okay, it will work, but from projector's perspective, it's quite painful to process such events. So let's say that I would like to create a functionality that will send an email if I spot that the current balance is below some threshold. So with a delta change, I would need to query some external resources to get the current balance. And my suggestion is to enrich the event with the current balance, with some additional information, so that the projectors will be extremely easy to implement. Because if I have all the data inside my event, uh, then I don't need to query anything, I don't need to calculate anything, my projectors, projections are really, really easy. And the extreme version of events enrichment is to put the whole state to the event payload. Mm, I've done this once and I, I don't recommend it, uh, because then you would need to support pretty complex schema uh, and that's always quite painful. Besides uh, business data, most likely you will put some technical metadata to the event's payload, so uh, things like sequence number, creation of timestamp, uh, event ID for the duplication, for example, command ID that was the source of this event, uh, correlation ID if you want to track the whole business process across many uh, microservices. So my piece of advice here is to encapsulate all this information in some metadata object. Uh, it will be easier to handle it later. Um, yeah, so now we know everything. What we want to implement, how, where to store events, how to store them, how, how to compose events. So let's implement some event sourcing. Where? Everywhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's the first, um, I mean, this is the major problem with event sourcing adaptations. In your core domain, you should choose even some subset of this domain, probably the part which brings money. And maybe this is a good candidate for event sourcing, maybe not. So remember about this slide, and now we can focus on more classic problems. Uh, and the first problem you might think of is the time required to replay all the events and get current version of the state. Surprisingly, this is a pretty fast operation to, to load, let's say, 100 events and recreate the state or even 1,000 events. Many people ask about it, so we can start with it. The solution here is snapshotting. So make sure that your event sourcing framework library supports snapshotting. Snapshotting is basically saving a snapshot of the state every X event. And then to recreate the state, you just need to load latest snapshot and all events after the snapshot. Uh, before you enable snapshotting, make sure that you really need it. Uh, create some benchmarks because the hidden cost of snapshotting is that you will need to uh, handle a state schema uh, if you enable it. Another approach would be to keep everything in memory. So once you load the state, uh, it will wait to handle next command. Uh, and yeah, that's why even sourcing based on Akka is, is so fast because everything is in memory and it's hard to make something faster, to be honest. This technique is called write-through cache. Uh, if you want to read more about it, link on the slide. 
Uh, because everything is in memory, you can expect uh, <laughs> out-of-memory exceptions. And out-of-memory exceptions in Java are quite boring. Anybody can, should expect it. And uh, just make sure that you don't do anything stupid with your state and you should be fine. But this brings us to the next problem question. Uh, should my state be immutable or not? By default, of course immutable. But as usual, it depends. So in my case, when we were using immutable lists, we were able to handle like uh, 17 operations per second. And then we switched to good old fashioned Java tree map and 2200 operations per, per second. And this difference is so huge that it, I, I, I cannot simply ignore it. Uh, so we go with mutable state. Still, there, there is an actor, which is a state guard. So I'm pretty comfortable uh, in a multi-thread environment. Fixing the state. So from time to time, you, you would need to fix the state because you produced some wrong events, things like that. And there is a temptation to update events directly in your database event store. No, uh, events are immutable. And to fix the state, you should, apply, you should apply a healing command, which could produce a healing event uh, or existing event. And this, this is the way to fix the state. Uh, this one is boring. OK, handling duplicates. Oh my god, this is a nightmare in the distributed systems. Uh, let me tell you a story. This is a fairyland, and this first unicorn is called exactly once delivery, and the second one is called transaction between two aggregates. None of them exist. <laughs> and you know, I'm a happy father of twin sisters and a boy, but let's focus on twin sisters. So when I'm saying that there is no such thing as exactly once delivery, I know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. So wh why duplicates? Uh, first of all, you can produce duplicates on your producer side, but even if you are able to filter out them here, you should be able to, uh, you should be ready to handle them on the uh, consumer side, so projector side. Uh, in case of, you can get them in, uh, during some restarts, crashes. Uh, and the best way to handle this situation is to have idempotent updates. So processing the same event twice will not change anything. That's great. But some projections are not idempotent by default. So let's say that I'm counting an average. Processing the same event twice will corrupt the result. So uh, the solution here is to apply some, so some the duplication strategy and you should try to achieve effectively once delivery, which is a far better name than exactly once delivery. Uh, how to do this? Once again, you can track your sequence number. So if the sequence number is plus one, then yeah, I can process this event. If it's plus two or minus one, then I should uh, skip it because this is a duplicate. If it's plus two or more, then the only thing you can do is to throw exception because you have a gap in your event bus and the problem is on the producer side. Um, if you don't have sequence number, you can use some event ID for the duplication as well. But then you need to store some history of events IDs, and uh, and you will be you you cannot store all of them, so you need to manage how far in the past you want to go. I mean, from the for, from from the, the duplication perspective. Uh, the only gotcha here is that um, you should save your read model update and sequence number or event ID in transaction. And surprisingly, not all uh, storages support such transaction. Uh, so it's definitely possible with relational database, but uh, with a distributed database, f forget about it. Uh, in Redis, uh, transactions are something completely different. You can simulate it, but you need to use a different, uh, mm, uh, different operations. Uh, yeah, so Make sure that your underlying storage uh, supports such transaction because otherwise you cannot deliver effectively once delivered. A broken re read model. Uh, when you can broke your read model? So two main reasons for that. A bug in the code, obviously, uh, and a harder failure. So some read models are more fragile than other ones. So Redis is a very good example once again. So in case of Redis, you can always lose some data. And Actually, quite a lot of them. Depends on your configuration. F thanks to event sourcing, you can always delete the whole read model and recreate it from the beginning. Uh, this is one of the best features of event sourcing. I've used it many times. It saved my 
reputation many times. Uh, maybe not many, but a few times. Uh, so that's great, but sometimes processing millions of events from the history will take some time. And if this is uh, not a software failure, but a hardware failure, uh, I would recommend to use something called manual offset management. So in transaction, you will save your read model update and the actual offset from your event bus or from your event store. It's technology dependent. It, it won't be possible in some cases, but uh, then, in case of some uh, hardware issues, you can always uh, read the latest successfully saved offset and start processing from that offset. Multi-aggregate transactional update, the second unicorn. So, if you need to update two aggregates uh, in transaction, then it's time for a pause. Start with rethinking your aggregate boundaries. Maybe you have two thin aggregates, and if you simply join them together, you will eliminate this problem. Sometimes your aggregates boundaries are fine and you still need to handle it. And uh, forget about distributed uh, transaction. Uh, just look at it as a transaction between two microservices. And the best way to handle it is to apply compensating action. And compensating action can be optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, these are not official names, I just made it up to explain how you can approach to compensation. Uh, so in pessimistic version, let's say that we are building very easy application for selling tickets or reserving seats to some cinema shows. And we have two aggregates, user uh, aggregate uh, with some funds and funds can be charged and cinema show when, where we can book the seat. So in pessimistic version, first we will charge the user because it's pessimistic. <laughs> And then we will book the seat. And uh, that was the last seat, so all seats are sold out. Unfortunately, our applications are used by many users concurrently, so right after charging the first user, another user can book this last seat. So this booking will fail, and it will be nice to have a transaction here. No. Uh, once again, look at it as a transaction between two separate microservices. And the way to fix it is to apply compensating action, simply refund the money. From optimistic compensation perspective, first we will book the seat, uh, that was the last seat, and we will charge the user. So in case of concurrent booking, we can enter an overbooked state. Uh, and now the question is, should we charge the user? In case of cinema business, I suppose it's not a good idea. But uh, if, you, if you are selling um, tickets for a plane, Overbooking is perfectly fine. It's, it's a part of business strategy. So remember, different business use cases, different uh, approaches to compensa compensation. Uh, one thing missing here is how to implement it. And for that, most likely you will end up with a saga pattern. And saga pattern could be implemented as a choreography, which basically uh, you are consuming two or more stream of events. And if you spot some inconsistency, you will apply compensating action. Uh, or you can implement it as a choreography where you have one single place with the whole business process. And the first one is way easier to start, but with time it might be problematic to figure out what is the actual event flow. And the second one is, is more difficult to begin with, but the advantage is that you have a single place with the whole business process. Uh, Saga pattern is really easy to explain, but not so easy to implement because Saga must be persistible, it must survive restarts. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, events order, you cannot assume any events order, so it, it must be irrelevant for, for the implementation. There will be always some time window limitations, so let's say that I, I just consumed the uh, booked event, now I'm waiting for charged event uh, for 10 minutes. And if I don't spot this event, then I would need to apply compensating action, but this event can arrive to me after 12 minutes, that's why compensating action must be commutative. A uh, few more links about Saga for you. Uh, event sourcing versus Rodos slash GDPR. So uh, your application should give users some, uh, uh, something called right to forget. And how to do this with event sourcing where you cannot delete events? Actually you can. But yeah, that's true, you should avoid it. Uh, so the technique here is called data shredding. 
Basically, you are encoding some sensitive information with an encoding key, and if you want, if you need to delete user data, you just need to delete user key. Sounds easy, but then managing those keys, uh, it's quite painful. Not to mention that you need to remember about retention policies uh, of your message brokers, backups, logs, and data before GDPR migration. Uh, okay, that's problem. So, as I mentioned, in our final version, uh, we are using a sharded cluster solution, and with any cluster solution, you should expect a nasty problem, which is called a split brain. So what is split brain? Uh, let's say that you have a cluster with five nodes and uh, some load balancer on top of it, and the load balancer is a dummy machine. It will simply route all your requests in a round-robin fashion to all nodes. So the first request to update user with ID 1 uh, is, was redirected to node 5. But node 5 is in the cluster, so this node is aware that uh, actual node 1 is responsible for user 1. So it will redirect this command or this request to node 1 and node 1 will handle it, because we have single writer principle. And then we have some disaster in our DC, a broken switch, a network connectivity issues, etc. Et uh, and uh, we, ju we just have... Uh, I mean, the nodes create two separate clusters. So the next request to update user with ID 1 from node 5 will be redirected to node 4, because in this cluster, node 4 is responsible for user 1. But the next request from the load balancer will go directly to node 1, and in this smaller cluster above, node 1 is still responsible for user 1. So there you have a classic split brain scenario. And fixing the state after such failure mm, requires mm, some level of humiliation. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not even possible, uh, so some data could be lost. So, some cluster best practices. Uh, remember about the split brain pro problem, uh, and it doesn't matter if you have uh, Akka cluster or Kafka cluster or Cassandra cluster, there will be a split brain. Uh, in the case of Akka cluster, you should enable a split brain resolver and configure it before you go into production on production. And uh, yeah, prepare very good monitoring and alerting to know 24-7 what is going on with your nodes. Uh, a lot of failover tests, so create your own chaos monkey, uh, put some load and then try to restart uh, randomly all your nodes. Uh, cluster should be deployed not only on production but also on dev and staging environment just to test more. And keep it as small as, po as possible. So when it comes to code base, if some functionality, ca functionality can be moved to a stateless service, just move it there, because scaling stateless services is, is way easier. And uh, managing a cluster with five nodes is, is much easier than man managing a cluster with 15 nodes or, or more. And if, if, this, uh, if this sounds scary to you and too complex, I will agree. Calix is once again an answer here. <laughs> okay, summary of this whole presentation. Uh, event sourcing is great, it's awesome. You will love it the second time you use it. <laughs> the, the first one will be, will be painful. And uh, that's why carefully choose your event sourcing framework or library. Really, take your time. Uh, there is no perfect database for event sourcing, just optimal compromise. Uh, understand your events, command, state, schema evolution, and uh, really spend some time on that. And I'm not talking about hours here, I'm talking about days. It's a really important topic, although it's, it's quite boring. Uh, eventual consistency is your friend. Do not fight with it, just learn how to deal with it. Scaling is complex. Uh, yeah, launching Akka cluster, Cassandra cluster, uh, Kafka cluster will require a lot of time, but at the same time, the reward will be proportional to the effort. And the whole event sourcing is basically turning your database inside out. And uh, this is really awesome for service-to-service -service communication. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to cover this topic. Uh, and uh, the last point is a little bit philosophical. So once you create your first application, where basically the core of this application is processing stream of events, you will realize that all the big players are using the same techniques. So Twitter, Facebook, Netflix, whatever. All these guys are using the same techniques. Uh, most of the DB engines are using the same techniques. 
And yeah, that's, the, that's why it's, it's a recipe for building highly reactive, scalable, s distributed solutions. I really recommend to try it, uh, to use it. Uh, it will change your mindset in a good way. And that's all it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here for you. If you can. Uh, by the way, I will, I will upload the slides, so just try to find me on Twitter. Or...